Hi there, I'm Gary, welcome to my channel and welcome back if you've been here before. Today is combo day on the kit of the week, which is of course the MiG-29 in 172nd scale from ICM in the colours of the Ghost of Kiev. In today's show, I'll have a look at the history of the MiG-29 and indeed the story of the Ghost of Kiev. I'll then have a look inside the box if you're going to buy one of these, see what you get for your money. And then finally, I'll show you how to put it all together once you've got it. All of these things come as chapters. You can hop backwards and forwards as your heart desires. Now, if you like the video, and I hope you do, then please do remember to give it a like by clicking the thumbs up symbol down there. Also, if you haven't done so already, please do subscribe to the channel. You do that by clicking on the small logo down there in the bottom right corner doesn't cost you anything helps me enormously and of course if you do want to support future productions you can do that through super thanks just down there that lets me know which videos you particularly like of course and if you like the channel in general you can support me through patreon or through buy me a coffee links to both of those are in the information box below let's get on then and start with a look at the history of the mig-29 and the ghost of Kiev. Shortly after Russian forces crossed the border into Ukraine on 24th of February 2022, initiating a full-scale invasion, footage started to appear on social media allegedly showing fighter jets in the skies over the capital, Kiev. Rumours started to circulate that a single pilot had shot down six Russian aircraft in the first 30 hours of the offensive. The pilot was soon nicknamed the Ghost of Kiev. The aircraft this new ace was flying was the MiG-29 Fulcrum. The MiG-29 was developed in the early 1970s as part of a Soviet plan to counter expected new American fighter designs. These later materialised as the F-15 and F-16. Two designs were sought, a heavy fighter in the F-15 class and a lightweight fighter in the F-16 class. The former came from the Sukhoi Design Bureau and became the Su-27 flanker. The latter from the Mikoyan Bureau became the MiG-29. The first flight of the MiG-29 was in 1977 with the aircraft entering service in the Soviet Air Force in 1982 and being given the NATO reporting name of Fulcrum A. From the outset, the MiG-29 was intended to be a dogfighter. It has superb manoeuvrability thanks to its advanced aerodynamics and its powerful Klimov RD-33 engines take it to a top speed of Mach 2.25 at high altitude. The aircraft was a star at many Western air shows, such as Farnborough in 1988, amazing everyone with its agility. However, MiG-29s also crashed very publicly, one at the Paris Air Show in 1989, an event which I saw myself, and two more colliding at an air show in the UK in 1992, although in each case the pilots ejected safely. Used to replace the MiG-23 Flogger in the point defence role, the MiG-29 had a typical weapons load of two AA-10 Alamo radar homing missiles plus four heat-seeking missiles such as the AA-8 Aphid or the later AA-11 Archer. The MiG-29 also has an internal 30mm cannon with 150 rounds. The first significant upgrades were made in the late 1980s creating the Object 913 or MiG-29S, known to NATO as the Fulcrum C. This had improved avionics, a dorsal hump containing electronic countermeasures and extra fuel, the ability to carry the more modern AA-12 ADA radar homing missile, and limited ground attack capabilities. By 2008, many early Russian MiG-29s had been grounded awaiting update to the latest MiG-29 SMT standard. New build aircraft are still being delivered to the Russian Air Force 
as the MiG-29M and the heavily modified MiG-35. Various downgraded export versions of the MiG-29 were sold around the world. However, the MiG-29S aircraft made for the Soviet Union's domestic market were kept on by the countries recreated by the split of the Soviet Union. This included Ukraine, which is how the Ghost of Kyiv came to be flying one. Former Ukraine President Petro Poroshenko posted a tweet showing a pilot he claimed was the Ghost of Kyiv, although this photo turned out to be an old image. Media outlets even identified the Ghost as being one Major Stepan Tarabalka, a real Ukrainian pilot who had been killed in action on 13th of March. However, on the 30th of April, Ukraine's Air Force Command admitted that the entire story was a myth, instead saying that the ghost represented the collective spirit of Ukrainian pilots. Suddenly, the legend of the ghost of Kiev was a morale booster for the Ukrainian people in the early stages of the war, and is now being used by ICM to sell kits of the MiG-29, with 50% of sales being donated to the Ukrainian Armed Forces. This kit from ICM is based on their 2008 model of the MiG-29, originally released as a Soviet fighter and as boxing in the colours of the Swift's aerobatics team. This kit is also the basis for the Modelist releases in 2011 and 2015. The ICM kit now comes with new decals and paint scheme. Weapons are the same as before. Interestingly, Scalemates also shows a new diorama boxing from ICM of a Russian MiG-29 with Soviet ground equipment vehicles as an imminent release. The only direct competition in 172nd for this kit is from Mr. Craft. Their kit started life as a release from Nakotne in 1992 before being sold by Zvezda from 1995. I'm not entirely sure why it was illegal to sell this outside the USSR then. Anyway, the kit came to Mr. Craft in 2016 and is now released with new decals for the Ghost of Kiev. There are plenty of MiG-29 kits in 172nd around as well. Both Trumpeter and Zvezda sell the 913 version, as flown by the Ghost of Kiev, and there are companies that make paint masks for the digital camouflage system, as well as national markings. RCM also markets a set of acrylic paints specifically for this kit. Looking at the box itself, the cover art is unforgettable. The colour print outer comes off the top, then there's a hinged lid to the box itself. Inside is an instruction sheet. Tucked away inside this are the two decal sheets. The parts are on three grey and one clear plastic sprue, all of this in a cellophane bag. The first sprue contains the upper and lower fuselage halves, as well as the exhaust turbine faces and nozzles for the engines. The next sprue contains the wing and tail assemblies, all of which are in one piece, plus the air inlets, cockpit and ejection seat. Then there is this sprue with the armament, fuel tanks and undercarriage. There are two each of three types of missiles, the big AA-10 Alamo radar homing missiles, the medium sized AA-11 Archer and small AA-8 Aphid heat sicking missiles. Finally there's the transparent sprue with the windshield and canopy, the IRST scanner cover and two parts which they don't reference in the instructions but which may be landing light covers. The instruction sheet itself is a single fold A4 printed in full colour with paint references and numbered sprue layouts which I like. The instructions seem 
clear enough. On the back is the decal positioning information. As for the plastic, it seems very well molded. I love these open intake louvers. And there's decent detail and sharpness. There's this tiny bit of flash on this turbine disc here, but nothing major or annoying. I kind of expected there to be a lot more, as I'm sure they are banging out these kits as fast as they can right now. The panel lines look okay, and the gaps of the control surfaces are slightly more pronounced. We'll have to see how the extensive decals handle these later on. The instrument panel has a lot of surface relief that may be an issue with the decals as well. And the tub in, of the cockpit is okay, there's a bit of flash here. But the buttons are all very well raised, that will make them very easy to dry brush. There's some nice rivet details on the inside of the gear doors too. The seat itself is quite basic with simple straps. If you were doing an open cockpit, then an aftermarket interior would be a really good idea. The weapons are fairly well moulded with this just one little bit of flash here, otherwise it all looks pretty crisp. It's the pity that the one piece wheels have the injector point halfway up the edge, but it's not a disaster. The decals themselves look sharp, although it can be a little difficult to tell with this really stripy support paper. All the edges certainly look sharp and well printed, and the colours are spot printed so they're bold and in excellent register. I'm making a start with the cockpit as usual. Here I'm going to paint the tub and instrument panel with a USAF medium grey as it seems about right. I'll also use the same colour on the ejection seat for the moment. Now looking at the instrument decals there's little if any correlation between the decal sheet and the instrument panel so I'm going to paint my own. It's really not too difficult to get a convincing look. First thing is to add black to all the dials. Also, the face of the panels where there's loads of buttons. Then a dark green colour to the multifunction panel and the radar screen. I, I guess that's what they are anyway. Then go to town with dry brushing and little spots of white, yellow and red. And before you know it, you'll have a convincing instrument panel. If you look closely, you'll see these are all just tiny dabs of colour. No detail per se, but from a distance they're very convincing. A couple of pale green dots on the screens and I'm done. I'm going to add the stick to the cockpit tub now. You can see I've also painted the side panels in black and I'll dry brush them later. The sides of the ejection seat I'm painting an off black, actually it's Revel Anthracite, as I think it looks better than a pure black. The straps I'll paint a generic kind of sandy colour and when they'll dry, I'm going to add some panel wash to pick up the edges. Any overspill, you can pick up with a clean brush. So now the ejection seat can be fitted into the cockpit tub. It needs to locate backwards against the depression it sits in to be in the right spot. Then the instrument panel can be set into the front end of the tub and the cockpit is complete. Well, while that's setting up, I'll take the fuselage halves off the sprue. There's a bit more flash everywhere than at first glance, so just sand bits down as you go along. Then the cockpit tub can go into place in the upper fuselage. Now, I found this didn't sit absolutely right, as the upper fuselage was slightly sort of crimped out of shape. But by pushing the tub into place and using ultra-thin cement, I was able to get it to sit just right. Don't be tempted to sand the tub to fit, because the upper fuselage won't then join the lower half properly. And there it is, I think quite convincing, especially as this will have a closed canopy. So the lower half of the fuselage needs some preparation. There are these ejector pins that should be sanded down to ensure a decent fit. Time for a confession, I missed the next bit. You should fit part B5 to the top of the nose wheel bay, as you can see here. I didn't notice this. Lesson learnt, make sure to read and understand everything in the instructions before you start and don't rush. So now, join the two halves of the fuselage together. There are locator pins and lips, 
but they don't seem to fit very well straight away. So what I did was start at the back, get that done and then work my way forward. I got all the rear fuselage aligned, then taped and clamped it. I then added ultra thin cement to hold it all together. Then I taped up the nose in what seemed to be the right position. Now while all that sets, there's plenty of time to start on building the missiles. These big old AA-10s need half of their fins added. There's also plenty of time to start painting the wheels and tyres. Now with the rear of the fuselage set, I'll make sure the front fits together properly. I'm going to add a dab or two of super glue or CA glue as a kind of spot weld here. And once those are done and I'm happy, I can go around the seam with ultra thin cement. Leaving that to one side again, I'll start on the air inlets. These come in two halves with some tabs to help locate the edges. Now I found it easiest to get the two halves in place on this bottom seam first and then seal it with some ultra thin cement. When that's done, I can secure this inside clip with more cement. The intake ramp slots into place like this then the small splitter plate goes in at the top and then repeat the whole process for the other side. The exhausts come in two pieces each, a turbine disc and a nozzle. They simply glue together. When these are all dry, the intakes go on the belly of the fuselage and align with the engine housing. And with those set, I'll add the wings, tailpane and some fins all of these go on with very straightforward slots, although do be aware the slots are different for each fin to make sure they go on the correct sides. Then the exhausts can go on the back of the engine pods. Then leave everything alone for quite a while to set up. Next I'll paint the inside of the canopy area. I'm using the base colour for the top, which is a USAF light grey, and then I'll add some black to the instrument boxes. Then the canopy can just slide into place. You'll see I've already taped up the edges and when it's set, the windshield can go in. When they're all set up nicely, I'll coat the inside of the masks with liquid mask. Then on to painting and the whole kit gets some gray primer before the top gets a couple of coats of USAF light gray. It's supposed to be some sort of off-white, but I didn't have time to get some. So I used the closest thing I had. I guess you could maybe add white to something like light gull grey too. Anyway, the underside gets a coat of sky grey. Then with the paint all set, it's onto the pixel camouflage decals. Start out with a few of the smaller pieces to get used to handling them. They're very thin, but surprisingly strong. I didn't manage to tear any and I was being quite forceful at times. You'll soon develop a feel for them. The trickiest one of all is this huge decal across the back. Now, because it's got to go over the hump of the fuselage, I thought I'd start on one side, then drape it over the spine. It wasn't too bad, in fact. Just keep plenty of water at hand to help pick up small sections to reposition them and to take out creases. And once you've done that, plenty of decal setting solution and it actually sits really quite well. Now I know it's not perfect, but I am pretty happy with my first ever pixel camouflage. Other decals can be added once these have dried fully. Moving on now, and I've got some metal panels to paint at the back of the engine, a kind of steel for the covers, then a burnt iron for the exhausts themselves. Right then, back to building, and it's the undercarriage. Now, the main gear leg fits into a quite supportive hole here with a trailing actuator link that sits into a hole at the back. The nose gear has an actuator leg at the front. These main gear doors kind of hook over the edge and sit wide open. The other doors sit next to the main gear leg. At the nose, there are two gear doors and a small cover for the actuator leg. While all those are setting, I'll start adding the missile pylons. These small gear door actuators can be fitted next, and then I'm going to add the wheels. The main wheels just slip on. 
The nose wheels have shaped slots so they sit with the fodguard at the back. Next I'll add the missiles. I painted them white with a kind of fiberglass nose for the big AA-10s. The last few pieces can go on now with some landing lights for the main gear doors, a couple of antennas for the nose and the glass cover for the IRST detector. And with that, my Ghost of Kiev is complete. So I did have a few issues along the way, mainly making absolutely sure that all the pieces are cleaned and dry fitting. There's a little bit more flash than at first view. Otherwise the fit is generally okay. The decals are a challenge, but look really cool and the end result is very pleasing. Now if, unlike me, you don't rush and you take your time, this will be a very creditable kit. There we go then, the Ghost of Kiev. Really enjoyed that one. Now, if you've enjoyed it as well, then please do remember to say so by clicking on the thumbs up logo down there. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the channel. It doesn't cost you anything, helps me enormously. All you have to do is click on the logo down there in the bottom right corner. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have enjoyed it and I will see you next time.